dear father, I cannot begin to express the gratitude I have for being here at this moment. The greatness of the Empire will be felt by all, thanks to your plans. And here at the front of it all, I can't help but be moved by the mission we are undertaking. Mars gives us all an inner strength that you have unleashed on the impudent Sassanids. Their masses, their beasts, their taste for blood sand breakfasts. <laughs> we will erase it all. They marched on us these past two days, and now just one more sleep awaits before they meet us in battle. The men are as eager to prove themselves as I, only disappointed that a greater challenge was not on offer. After this, you must send us to Antioch, or Mesopotamia even. We will make the Sassanids cry out in despair as they fall to your knees, father. I shall give offerings for the safety of both of us, and all loyal Romans. This future you're going to make, the thought of it pushes us all, father. Let's remake the empire our inbred predecessors stole from us. Let's keep the light of reason and honor in this world. You, I, and brother Eutropius, I know we will do it. Excuse my emotional language. The eve of battle brings it out in all of us. I will write the conclusion to this message tomorrow with full details of our victory. Welcome back to Fields of Mars, where in the previous episode we finally made some good progress. We got a peace deal with the Alamans that avoided for us a large invasion that was on the way. Anisius went around in Egypt and essentially sorted everything out, securing our back lines and taking out the armies in our territory. We had a big push against the Sassanids in Anatolia, where after a few battles we were able to take Tarsus from them. Plus, Anistius went on to attack the Sassanids further south, since there wasn't much around, taking a couple more regions from them. We learned, though, that both Uther and Julianus, two of our senior commanders, died of natural causes at this point in the campaign, but this only spurred us on to make a bigger focus on our main rival, the Sassanids, and one part of that was sending Septimus's first son, Murina, to attack the island of Rhodes. What happened was we had to face the army that was in Rhodes at the same time as their garrison, and in the battle, Murina unfortunately fell to Pygon Band, no less, supposedly one of the worst units in the Sassanids roster, but we've seen a few times in this campaign, they're actually quite OP for what they are. So anyway, yes, he was killed while trying to escape from the arrival of Pygon Band to attack him, but the rest of the army is doing a bit better, it's the standard sort of fight, just lots of lesser infantry than ours getting killed on our front line whilst most of our units hide from the enemy's large missile superiority. Once that front line is dead we can start charging forwards to engage all those missile units if we can. And here I'm trying to thin out the Pikin Bow with my archers but they just won't leave. They have very high morale for guys with no weapons training and are supposedly a tier 1 unit. But still, you can get rid of them eventually, we have the numbers to do it. And the battle actually ends in a heroic victory for us. Everything went perfectly except for the loss of Murina, our faction heir no less. And I was actually a little bit surprised to get a heroic victory because the balance bar was just even there and we didn't really defeat that much of the enemy army, especially their garrison. A lot of it's still alive because it just routed away and managed to escape while we were hunting down all their ranged units. So that's a shame we didn't completely wipe them out. There'll probably still be another battle and we'll have to find a new commander for that army. But first, we've got another battle happening further to the northeast where Eutropius was heading to try and relieve the attack on Trapezus. You can see happening there from Aria. But on the way, two Sassanid armies caught up with him from the fog of war and attacked. I tried to avoid them, but we had the classic and rage uninstalled inducing retreat mechanic come into play where he retreated into the Aryan army and got stuck outside their zone of control then the two Sassanid armies just shuffled forwards to attack him again and the Aryan army will now join the fight 
so things are actually harder than they were before. And Eutropius' army is probably among the worst armies we have out there in the field. I wasn't expecting him to do heavy lifting over here, so he's in big, big trouble. For this fight, I'm going to corner camp, not just because we're overwhelmed and this will give us a small chance of survival, but because the corner happened to be the best part of the map. And when the corners look so good tactically, I always don't feel bad for exploiting the AI in this fashion. Anyway, the AI is going to be forming up across the entire map. No terrain considerations for them because their army is so big it can go from corner to corner with its front line. Now they did have a couple of large onagers coming in as reinforcements and I spotted a chance to take them down. Those large onagers would annihilate us if we gave them the chance to fire on our front line. So this is very fortunate. A single unit of cavalry manages to hit them. They are so slow that they don't keep up with other units as they come in as reinforcements. So that's why they're there on their own. The rest of their army is just walked off. The question was, would they come back to support their onagers? And the AI sometimes does, sometimes doesn't. I think once it's far away enough, it just ignores the units that are being attacked until it's finished forming up. It sort of gets fixated on forming its army together and just won't fight you until it's done. But once it is done, that formation is going to come and hit our front line. And the sheer numbers of the enemy will start coming into effect immediately because they're going to have tons of archers that will just be raining arrows everywhere. If we were playing as a faction that couldn't put stationary to studio on most of its frontline units, this battle would already be over. But fortunately, our front line is going to be safe against these attacks. They're going to have to beat us primarily with melee attacks. They're starting off badly, sending in terrible units like Persian Brigade. Now, there's the sort of trash I expected the Pagan Band to be. They just do absolutely nothing in melee and they're going to leave pretty soon. They've also got plenty of cavalry of course being the Sassanids. They're going to smash into our ranks. The station into Studio also providing a defense against that. They're very kindly sending in their horse archers to melee as well. That is good of them. And really a frontline engagement is just going to break out and we can't really move. We can't go out of stationary to Studio at any point during the battle. So it's just a case now of letting them grind against our front line and hoping we do as much damage to them as possible and uh, perhaps hanging on to the forlorn hope that we might do enough damage to rout their armies. Did I try too hard? Did I serve too well? Did I pray too often? Or not enough? What is this for? Come on, tell me! Mars? Jupiter? Juno? Vulcan? Bacchus? Even you Bacchus have nothing to say now! I've worshipped you so very heavily today. Come on! Can't let this be how it all ends. You know what I'm capable of. What, is the Empire going to fall? Is that it? Is this how you'll make sure it happens? You'll regret it. You'll lose everything too. Idiot gods for an idiot world. Idiot! I'll be glad to be rid of this useless life. My damned brothers can sort this mess out. The Senate, ah, the Senate, if they were here, their faces, <laughs> it would be a thing of beauty worth dying a thousand times over to see. Find me a coward and dress them in robes, it will have to do. In come the elephants, the next challenge for our front line. I didn't have any javelins available to take them down, the large onagers managed to kill a couple of them with their explosive shots. But now they're in, our cohort auxilia will just have to fight them and our archers will try to shoot them. We're pretty close and elephants are okay to shoot when they're in amongst your own men since it, the model is above them. The archers can sometimes avoid too much friendly fire. So we'll damage them that way and hopefully that will be enough. Our explosive shots continue to rain down though and we're doing some danger close fire and I did get one hit on my own ranks there. These big blobs of enemy troops are perfect targets for the explosive shot we're taking out lots of infantry and perhaps more importantly elephants and heavy cavalry things that the cohort can't really fight with their basic melee skill so that's all well and good more troops out here who are forming up ready to attack are the victim to some large onager hits there's so much cav just waiting around there they're basically confused that they can't go around my right flank so they're just waiting for something else to open up they'll come into the fight eventually now we do manage to kill their general on the front line that is perfect that's exactly what we need and really the only key to thinning out the enemy a little bit more but we've lost almost all of the unit on that corner of our line so it's looking very dodgy 
An explosive on a jet attack almost kills another enemy general here. All the men behind him died, but he is pretty badass. He just stands there and cool guys do not look at explosions. Unfortunately, a second volley annihilates the front part of his unit. I believe the officer actually died and his remaining guards just charge forwards to join that melee. So that's all well and good. More morale debuffs taken away for the enemy, but is it doing anything? Well, maybe. The enemy's morale is low enough that we don't have to kill all of them to get rid of them, but they're still not leaving despite being very damaged in some cases, as we can see here. Now the problem we're going to face is that even if we do defeat units, which we did in many cases along the front line at this point, they've still got plenty more coming in and every time we destroy a whole unit another one will come in as reinforcements because they have more than 40 units available. So more and more stuff just piling in. There was a nice crowd here and I was a bit disappointed actually at my large onages. I was targeting the centre of this crowd but their shots seemed to land mostly on the edges. It was a bit confusing here. So although it's doing damage to them, I thought it would have done more damage if we'd hit where those arrows are pointing basically right in the middle of this blob of infantry coming in it would be very nice to thin them out with a few explosive rounds but not really happening all that much so of course that infantry is going to come in and start engaging with our front line what's left of our front line that is and there's not that much left of it so what i had to do was go for operation super corner camp i had about two or three units that still had enough strength to fight properly so what i did was just pull them back towards the absolute corner of the map while the units that were near dead or the units that weren't going to be very useful like the onager crews would stay to delay the enemy's advance their melee advance primarily to allow Allow me to set up this formation in peace. Fortunately, we weren't completely destroyed by rear attacks from the crossbow cab either. That was the other worry which we couldn't really do anything about. So it did work, we've got our units into our little corner position, not very many units, and they're currently under fire from the enemy slingers. There was kind of a delay in the battle because instead of following me up the hill, they sent only one unit after me, which was defeated. You can see their bodies on the floor here, it was just some generic spears who the cohort were fine to take down. But then they wanted to attack me with their slingers and they had about 10 units of slingers and they didn't want to do it all at once. So they were just cycling them through, putting different ones on the front line until they were out of ammo. So that took a very long time. Eventually, once they ran out of sling ammunition, which didn't really do anything, by the way, since they were mostly firing at my testudos, they came in to attack, and these cataphracts are going to have a nice time against the Gohawks. They're just blasting apart their formation. Even in stationary testudo, it's difficult to resist them. And this other unit facing a big blob of enemies too. They didn't get a very good charge, luckily, so that will be a bit of an easier fight. And all we can do now is hope we're totally surrounded, as surrounded as you can be with the red lines protecting you at least, so we can't move anywhere. We just have to fight forwards and see how many enemies we can take out. Something that's going to help us is the dead general and the fact that they're using a lot of ranged units in melee here. So we'll be getting a lot of kills and that'll cause a few units to rout, which demoralizes other things nearby. So those are all tools we can use to take out some of the stronger units. And the spear units they're fighting us with aren't very good anyway and can't really beat Cohort Auxilia from the front. So this grind went better than expected I must say. And here on the left where I thought my units would be defeated quite easily we actually pushed through, defeated a couple of units of cavalry using my spearmen and then killed a whole load of the Armenian slingers in melee to actually clear some space and give us the opportunity to try and do something here. So I'm going to send a few swordsmen I have left to a flank attack the big blob right next to them. That should go well, there's plenty of weak units like spears and slingers for them to attack there, plus this is going to be a nice morale shock for them. Doesn't get rid of them right away which would have been ideal but hopefully we'll reduce their numbers a little bit with this. Now the spear unit couldn't really do anything as it turned out because I had to just put them into stationary to studio right away. A crossbow cav unit was hanging around my onagers so now we're going to get shot at point blank range. If we go into stationary to studio it won't do any damage but of course we're stuck there and their rear is exposed to the other crossbow cav units that are coming in from a different direction. So what we found was that we were able to win that little melee with virtually nothing left over on our side but we still haven't completely routed our men's morale is high enough that they're continuing on and Eutropius is still alive at the back there he's lost most of his men to ranged fire but he's hanging on so he'll be providing a morale buff as well because he's a very high level general. Now the crossbow cav 
where my spearmen were, just charged forwards and annihilated them in melee, which I did not expect whatsoever. Those spearmen in stationary just due to are the hard counter to an attack by ranged cavalry in melee. But it just didn't work for whatever reason. They destroyed us, charged through, and now they could rear attack our cohort. This was pretty disastrous right now. We're hanging on and we're going to inflict damage to them. However, at this moment, Eutropius is killed, probably by the crossbow bolts coming from further down the hill. Those two units out there you can see. So that's going to inflict a morale shock on our remaining men. They don't rout immediately, they're going to keep fighting, and we do defeat those crossbow cav that were coming in. However, the other two units of crossbow cav will charge into melee as well, and that's going to be enough to finish our men off. They just can't take another charge, and they do fight basically down to the last man. Their morale was that high, but they are still going to lose that fight, crushed up against the red line of death there. The battle ends in a valiant defeat, and the most notable thing there is that by the end of that fight, there were only a few dozen enemy soldiers left on the field. We came about as close to winning that battle as is physically possible, but we still didn't get it. Lord, Lord Magister, Eutropius has fallen in battle, and his army is scattered or dead. What? My son? No, your brother, Magister. He crossed the path of a Sassanid invasion. Right. And the Sassanids? It seems he took most of them with him, Lord. Good. I mean, that is something good to take from this. I thought for a moment, how could they even reach my boy? But no, this makes more sense. I... I'm a little shocked. We'll be needing a new console, then. Wait here a moment. I will prepare a message for the Senate. Now they will have little choice. And the Sassanids dead too? Parting gifts, I suppose. Despite almost winning, the results aren't very good at all. We lost everything, obviously, except a few men who were going to escape somehow. And the enemy didn't lose all that much in terms of units. That second army keeping all of its units and as we know, that means if we can't attack them again really soon and they go back to their own territory, they will get most of the stuff they lost in that battle back for free. So whether we can make any good of this is a bit up in the air at the moment. Right now, it looks like this sacrifice is going to have achieved nothing. And the Sassanids, being particularly mean, aren't going to let those 30 guys or so escape either. So now I'm picking a new commander. This is for Murana's army over on Rhodes. I'm picking Veres. This is one of the two Senate commanders that I consider to be on the front lines vaguely because they've had various roles in moving troops about. Uh, that's Veres and Costa, so we'll look into those guys as they become more relevant. You can see that the siege at Trapezus was lifted in some way by that battle, so we didn't lose the settlement to Aria, which was why I went over there in the first place to try and prevent that from happening so I guess that worked out but still we are going to need to recruit more forces pretty quickly to deal with potential threats coming from that direction. Now with Varus, I wanted to see if I could take Rhodes right now and the balance spell wasn't as favourable as I expected and that's just because in that previous battle with Murana, we didn't kill all that many of the enemy. Lots of them escaped off the field before the battle ended so there's still a decent amount of Pygon band left hanging around. So I'm going to start a new army, just a little bit back from the front line actually. I thought if I put the army at, say, Sinope, the Sassanids might just come over immediately and kill the general. So it needs to be a tiny bit back from the front line. We'll do it at Ankara using the other general that I mentioned, Costa. We are going to be limited in our recruitment options. I've got the first level of the Imperia Pretoria building, so we can recruit some interesting units, but it's actually going to be easier for us to recruit the old-style Roman units since they're a higher tier and will be better at this point. Now, Anisius is going to take his army out to look at the Lachmids, and I do mean just look at them. I was going to try and attack this settlement, but I saw there was a full stack standing next to it, and the settlement itself has some decent-looking units in the garrison, including some cataphract camel-looking things. So I thought there's no point in risking it, although I thought we would win there. We don't want to win in such a way that we're weak and the Sassanids can just come out of the fog of war and take us out, so we'll just play it cool. The Sassanids are also putting pressure on us down in Alexandria. Their faction leader has brought their main fleet to come and blockade the ports. We have a chance in battle against them, but I'm not going to take it since we don't really need to at this point. I'm fine with them just blockading this port. That'll keep them busy for a while and we'll focus on attacking the Sassanids over land. 
And to that end, I wanted to come and just auto resolve this fight. I didn't want to have to fight another battle over this largely irrelevant settlement, so I thought I'd see what happens on the auto resolve. The balance bar can be inaccurate when you have a low level commander like Varus leading things, and things seem to go okay. We've got a decisive victory, decent losses, but this army will have time to replenish now. There are no more Sassanids in the area. I initially wanted to liberate something here because taking the province that's made up of all the islands in the eastern Mediterranean is kind of annoying, but we're just going to have to start doing it anyway. At least we'll be denying the Sassanids some income, although their income is uh, largely cheat-based at this point, so I don't think this really does anything to their economy. So we'll just have to try and take those islands over time if we can. A new war is thrown at us. It's Axum down in southern Egypt, and we're not going to bother calling in all our allies to this fight. This is another one of those wars where I'm just hoping nothing happens, a bit like our war with the Gaetulians we've got going right now. And those Gaetulians happen to be advancing on the Western Romans. I was hoping they would win that whole war for me, but maybe not. We'll have to watch out there. Too aggressive? Was Constans too aggressive? I don't think you can be too aggressive, not against Sassanid mobs. Let them think for a second that you don't intend to tear them apart and they'll start getting rowdy. And that's when they start fighting to the death for reasons that defy even the gods' knowledge. Aggression is how we win. Let this damn scar remind any who look at my face of that. It's the look of a man who wasn't afraid to die, and won because of it. We'll all look like me when the job is done. Only reason Constans didn't die covered in wounds was because he was a favorite of Mars. All of us haven't earned that. But we can still get his attention, get the job done, and get rich along the way. Anisius, perhaps bored with not being allowed to push east against the Lachmids, still finds something to do. He can go north to Tyrus. This port is undefended, so we'll just storm in and annihilate the garrison nice and easy. This is one of the Sassanid puppet states, and their garrisons seem to be a bit smaller than the Sassanid ones, so it's easier than usual. Now, I was thinking I could just sack it or create a liberated faction if I could, because Tyrus is in its own province. So it's going to be a bit annoying to hold, but I didn't really have the options, and the sacking money wasn't looking very good. So I ended up thinking, let's try occupying it. It's a nice idea just in terms of it opening up strategic options, because from there we can actually reach Antioch to the north, an important target for us. But it is going to be difficult to hold this province. We'll just see how it goes. Now, in the next turn, we learn of an illegitimate birth. This is uh, coming from Vitalus. That is the son of Uther. He's right over on the right-hand side of the family tree here somewhere. So he's having an illegitimate son, and the way to avoid that from happening again is to get him married. But unfortunately, he is not influential enough to find a wife. He is so unnotable that he's unable to attract anyone, it seems. So he'll just have to continue with his illegitimate children. I saw there also that Murana had uh, two illegitimate children before his demise. We might have to bring those guys into the family if we keep losing family members at the current rate. Now you can see I was checking out the fact that I could attack Antioch from Tyrus and uh, coming up with a plan here because Septimus can also attack Antioch, he's right next to it. So what I'm going to try is first setting the city under siege. This means the garrison can't come outside the city to take part in things. Now there is an army inside, but unfortunately for me that army happens to be in the docks rather than being in the city which technically doesn't mean they're in the city. It works slightly differently, uh, even though guys in the city could go into the docks at any time. Explicitly being in the docks is the thing that allows you to leave while you're under siege. So what that means is that when Anisius comes up, that army still takes part in this battle because it can sail out and come around and land somewhere else to take part in it. However, there is one way to potentially deal with that, and that is to bring Verus down. I'd moved him back to Mira to garrison the place, and after a lot of struggling to work out how to get him into ships, I thought, oh damn, I can't actually reach Antioch. The plan was to blockade the ports so that their boats couldn't come out. However, it turns out I can still reach it if I go over land first. This is one of the things that always takes me by surprise. It is, a lot of the time, faster to walk than to sail. While I think that's almost certainly not historically accurate, that's how it tends to work in Total War games. So if we walk most of the way and then just sail the last little bit going to the docks at Tarsus, then we can set that blockade up. 
So this means the fleet is no longer able to leave the city and we can attack that army outside with Anisius as I had initially planned. It's only a small army so they're not going to stay around for this fight but it gets them out of reinforcement range of the city and that's really what we needed here. We're just trying to take the settlement. But then I thought actually taking the settlement will uh, cancel out all of Septimus's movement points. So if I don't attack it right now we can use what movement points we do have to first kill this army and that's going to be no problem and then we can go back and still take the settlement. So we're just being completely merciless here. We want to deliver a very big blow to the Sassanids, so we're going to destroy one and a half of their armies by taking down that extra half stack. And of course, take this historic settlement. And the interesting thing about taking Antioch is that it denies Sassanids the access to the Mediterranean. They do still have a base on Constantia in Cyprus, but they can't move the majority of their forces out from their empire to the Mediterranean once we control this port. And I'm going to control it right now. We have a gigantic advantage there since we've got three armies coming in against their two, and one of them is a garrison army. And since one of their armies is in ships and we're attacking them with a navy, I presume that gives us extra power on the balance bar because we could theoretically destroy their army before the battle started. Anyway, whatever the case, we've got the settlement for ourselves. This is looking particularly good now. This links our southern territories in Egypt up to the ones in Anatolia. Our empire's being a bit more unified now. It's still not continuously unified over land because of various bits and bobs that are missing, but some parts are just controlled by our allied states. So in effect, we're slowly becoming one continuous empire. Now, what I wanted to see was... Are the Sassanids sufficiently intimidated by this move to end the war with us? We could do with not being at war with them, because although we are pushing the front line, all the territories we are taking are very unstable. We have rebellions literally constantly. Every single turn there are multiple rebellions, I just don't really show it in the videos. My allies and the Huns are going around killing them all for me, so I'm not really doing it myself for the most part. But it is a problem that is concerning me while playing anyway. So I wanted to try and get out of the war to deal with that. It didn't work, as we saw. And now the Lachmids are going to exploit the fact that Anisius has walked north by attacking Nova Trajana Bostra. Luckily, they just sack it. So that wasn't as bad as it could have been. We're going to keep our territory. And finally, we see the Aryan army back up at Trapezus actually just run away. So that situation has finally been resolved. Overall, things seem to be looking up. With Septimus Gurgis in supreme command, it seems that all men of any note were brought to the frontier to join his staff or command his armies. This may have been calculated on his part, for it meant that after the deaths of Uther, Julianus and Eutropius the Elder, there were no viable candidates for either of the two open consulships. Septimus argued to the Senate that the offices were not required, given that his office as Magister Militum was just as legitimate and seemed to get a lot more done. Indeed, the Senate had little love for the barely accountable duo of senior officers. One man could better control the military resources of the Empire, and one man could in turn be better controlled by the elected officials of the Empire. That was the theory, at least. That's all for now, thank you so much for watching and thanks as always to the officially Devon patrons. We'll finish gathering up our forces to hit the Sassanids as hard as we can, but more forces means more targets for them as well, as we'll see in the next episode of Fields of Mars.